Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening, or good morning or afternoon, depending on when you're listening to this. Welcome to the 64th of hopefully many episodes of Bard Advice. My name is Charles. Some of you may know me as Chaz, or Yazik, or the DM, or the Bard, or maybe something else even. And I'm the host of Bard Advice. It's a D&D slash TTRPG slash nerd podcast where we answer questions that you might have in regard to any of those things. So, at the top of the show, we like to remind everybody, as always, of the email for the show, which is bardadvice at gmail.com. If you have any questions, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques, etc., please send all of that to bardadvice at gmail.com. Even if it's just like a story, something that happened with your party, or a follow-up to a question that you've asked before, or maybe a follow-up to a question that someone else has asked before. Any and all of those things, please send to bardevice at gmail.com. If you'd like to get some merchandise, you can do so over at manshorts.com. And if you'd like to contribute to anything that I'm doing musically, you can do so directly via PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo, all of which are Yazik, Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. Also at the top of the show, we'd like to thank all of our members, patrons, super chatters, viewers in general. A reminder for everybody to please like, comment, subscribe, turn on the notifications, rate the podcast on your respective platforms. And I think that that's everything. So we're going to move into an art corner this week. I've actually got a couple of things for art corner because my wife and I have watched two Really great documentaries over the course of the last week, and I just wanted to tell everybody about them to go check them out because they're really good. So the first one is actually, it's kind of traumatic, but it's called The Program. It's on Netflix. It's a limited series documentary, so I think it's three episodes, and it is the unfortunate deep dive into these types of programs for troubled youth, um, notably teens who are behavioral issues, they have, they're usually from troubled families already, or sometimes even from foster care, and the tainted web of greedy lunatics that are running these types of programs and effectively abusing these children. So it is a tough watch and could be triggering for some people, but I definitely recommend it because I think it's important for everybody to watch it and know about that kind of stuff that's going on. It's really, really horrific. And honestly, I'm actually pretty happy that I never got sent to uh, a kind of program like that because I certainly was a behavioral case. So I'm very fortunate that I, you know, my family was able to deal with me without having to ship me off somewhere like that because, yikes, that is, <clears throat> it's really, really sad. And honestly, it's effectively human trafficking. So... You know, I hope that New York State and other states look into this. I hope that they make some legislation and stuff. Um, but it's really, really awful and terrible. And I think it's important for everybody to watch. On a more positive side of Art Corner, there is another documentary that my wife got me interested in and I couldn't stop watching once I really got into it. It's uh, it's a National Geographic documentary. It's actually from several years ago. But I believe it's on Disney Plus, and it's called Into the Okavango. It's, I mean, whoa. This thing is unbelievable. You just can't believe it. There's this massive delta in Botswana in Africa, and it's just humongous. And this guy kind of tracks it. He's mostly just recording the wildlife and just seeing, you know, how how the delta itself is fed, as well as, like, all the wildlife that are surrounding it and... It's incredible. You genuinely will see things that you've not seen before because in the documentary they go places that other people just have not gone before. There's, to my knowledge, no real other type of document documenting of this area and the places that they went. You know that what what they did just to give you a little detail is that, you know, there's this giant massive delta in Botswana. Angola is a country that's north of Botswana, and that's actually where the river that feeds the delta starts. So they go up there, and their plan is, we're just going to ride the river down into the delta. And for the first, like, two weeks, there's not enough area for them to actually float on water to use their boats because the area was so much peat, like peat moss that just holds all of the water. So they basically had to just drag their boats for the first, like, two weeks of the trip. 
But then they get to the water, and it just gets really awesome. There's hippos all over the place, elephants, etc. So really cool if you're into wildlife or any of that conservation type stuff. And while on Art Corner still kind of on the same topic, but it's also more of like a capitalist corner, <laughs> is uh, the dice. Sarah's dice are available. So if you don't know, we are in the process of doing our dice run this year. This is the second of four limited runs, and this is Sarah's Dice. So as you can see there, you can get those at KrakenDice.com. Go get you a set. They're, they are limited in the amount that we have. So if you want them, go get them. I recommend them. I will let you know that one of the D20s I helped design myself, and it is a D20 that is made for Sarah. So most of you probably already know what that means. I think that there's at least three 20s on it. There might be four. And one of the cards that you get in the dice gives you the opportunity to use that die in your campaign. <laughs> Obviously, of course, if your DM's okay with it, but you know. So you got a Sarah D20, so that's pretty neat. So yeah, go to Kraken Dice and get yourself a set of the dice. And if you don't have a set of the other dice and you want to get them, the Part Do dice, they're also available. I think there's still some of those left. And in a couple of weeks, we'll be releasing the third set, which, if I remember correctly, is going to be a rerun of the first set. Not the Part Do set, but the very first set that we made a year or two ago. So if you didn't get that very first set that we made and you want some, we're doing a rerun of those in the next in the coming weeks. And then beyond that will be the Florida Man Dice, which I'm excited about as well. So head over to KrakenDice.com and get yourself some dice. I know that a lot of you here have already gotten yours. We really appreciate it. And I hope that you enjoy them. I know that some of you guys got your first sets and seem to be happy with them. Kraken's a great company. Um, you know, they're a small, relatively small team. And... Um, it's a brother-sister team, and they're really cool people, and uh, work with them on a regular basis and hoping we can get these things sold, and maybe we can do some more partnerships in the future. Okay. Well, that was a long art corner, and we're going to have to get right into questions as well, because we've got several this evening. Hello, everyone. By the way, I didn't say hi. Usually I say hi to all of the regulars. Pirate Avram River, Chris, Cheeto. Yokai, Ruby, Ron, thank you all for joining, as usual, Rocco. It's much appreciated. Um, you, Like I said, I say before, you guys are the you know lifeblood of this podcast as much as I am. We do it together. It's a community effort, so it's much appreciated. And if you know anybody that's looking to listen to a D&D podcast, you can send them over here. Heck, we're 64 episodes in. That's over a year and counting. How about minis of the team? That would be super dope. Yeah, we might do that one day. I'm also still kind of in the early infant stages of developing something for a supplement. Um, it didn't work out with one company, but I think we're looking into another and we might be able to make something happen. So let's get into some questions. All right. So the first question this evening, according to the list of names, is from Spezia Poet. And I think this is a great question. It'll spawn a really interesting conversation among chat. Uh, so here we go. Spezia asks... Hello, good soul. Oh, that, that that's very nice of you. Thank you. I'm a forever DM. Been playing since 11, 28 now. I've been running this party for seven years with five players and a core four. Same setting, different characters across about 300 years of history. So cool. So the setting is very concrete, but now we're doing a warlord campaign, and they wanted a rise to power prologue. <laughs> I'm very much a DM that thinks it's thinks I'm the setting and ref, it's the PC's story. I'm just having an issue coming up with the spark for it. I know why and how. They're in a gladiator city that fuels the Empire, and there are ruling class issues. What kind of sparks do y'all find fun or interesting for revolutions? It's the first time they as players aren't building slash uniting the Empire. It's their first time burning it down. <laughs> Ideas. Well, thank you for the question, Spezia. I'm sure that chat has is full of great ideas. I'm going to let them cook for a minute while I go through a list of ideas and things that I had about it. Oppressive taxes come to mind, considering that's, you know, how our entire country came to be, for the most part. Starvation is a big one. Just general injustices. I thought maybe... Perhaps since it's D&D, &D, maybe the government is implementing some series of laws or regulations that govern or ban magic 
or even weapons. That's a good one. You could make it a religious thing. Maybe the government is imposing a particular god or a particular group of gods that have to be worshipped, and if you don't worship those gods, then you're exiled or, even worse, executed. You could also create, and this is actually, I saved this one for, well, really, this one came to me last, but it's last because I think it's the best suggestion. You could also create, if you wanted to, an NPC or a DMPC who kind of carries all of that. So, like a mysterious figure like the Gray Fox from Oblivion or Guy Fox, real guy, right? Somebody who kind of organized, who's kind of organizing the, the revolution or the takeover from the shadows. That's a really cool way to do it. Let's see what we've got in chat. Beware of the eyes of March. France equals bread. Yeah. Bread, it, it bread, it's easy as bread. How to spark a revolution. Definitely rotten food. Mandatory military. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Yes, Guy Fox. Lack of good Wi-Fi. Cereal for supper. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. I was actually going to mention that. I was like, yeah, you know, you could have like, I don't know, just like a CEO of like a food company who says that the people can eat cereal for dinner. I don't know, just as an example. What if the government is using more psionic abilities, mind reading, memory altering? Oh, that's cool. That could be cool. You could couple that with them limiting magic, right? That could be a thing. Maybe there's this new law that says no magic. And then also there's this plot going on where the higher ups, the rich, the, the politicians are doing just that. They're, they're, they're using psionic abilities and stuff. Throw a tea party in the harbor. Yeah. Eat eggs the wrong way. Gulliver tr Gulliver's Travels. Could be. You could make it something really petty. That might make it fun. You could have back-to-back -back kings or queens who persecute one religion for one reign, and then the other persecutes the other religion for the other, and the people get angry. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Where you just, maybe it's, and, and it could be just as simple as that, right? Where there's a shift in leadership, and it's so drastic that the people are just like, well, we're just going to burn it all down. If the party doesn't stop the ruling powers, the plane could be erased. Unseen shadow, shadow government led by Mind Flayer Council. Oh, I like that idea. Mind Flayer Council? Just didn't like the color of the flag or some strange... Yeah, silly quirk they all united around. I do like that idea. Something that's silly and goofy, because that kind of keeps it D&D. &D. So maybe you could find some sort of a combination in any of the things that we've recommended, and then also... If you do decide to make, like, a DMPC or an NPC, maybe his whole, like, soapbox is that it's just a goofy thing. That he's just, like, maybe, you know, somebody asks him, well, why are we having a revolution? And he's like, well, I don't like the color of the flag. <laughs> My current game has a hand of the king who's working with basically D&D CIA to weaponize a drug to create super soldiers. Nice. Band together with friends and family, people you 100% trust, and create a stronghold on the ranch and fight off everybody. <laughs> Institute a daylight savings time. Oh, yeah, we recently sprung forward. And you know what? You can keep it. Just keep that. We don't need to be doing it. That's probably top-tier dumbest stuff we do as a society is keep doing that. And places like Arizona and Hawaii don't even do it, which is proof that we don't need to do it because they just don't. And I only know that because I worked in phone sales and customer service for so long. And when you're doing outbound phone sales – there are limits about when and how often you can call. And so depending on the time of year, you would have to wait an extra hour to call places like Arizona and Hawaii because they don't participate in that stuff. They just don't do it. I'm like, well, we're just going to do, uh, we're just, we're just not going to do that. So yeah, we need to stop that stuff. Choking bureaucracy that protects the status quo. Comedy of errors. The emperor is so detached from the populace. They order laws that are purposely twisted to cause said revolution. True, and that seems to happen just generally throughout history, right? Looking at you, Kellogg's, and any of these people that are making the, 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 the now they're now they're on, now they're now we're on to ban TikTok, right? And look, I don't want to get too political, but I'll just say briefly, from what I understand, the text of that bill is also vague and such that it could be inclusive of anything. So it's not it's more than just like oh they're banning TikTok it's they're essentially giving them granting themselves the agency to just ban anything that they deem you know bannable which is it's a slippery slope but yeah so I think that's a solid answer I think there's some stuff in there for you Spezia 
some ideas, some great ideas from chat for sure. Pornhub just pulled out of Texas, really? Did, were they headquartered there? Why would they leave? Indiana didn't for the longest time. Hmm. <laughs> Phrasing. All right. So I think we've got an answer there for you. Once introduced a joke NPC that players made fun of, the many games later had him injured during a riot and became the centerpiece of a revolution. That happens. That definitely happens. When you... <laughs> the, that, we talked about that briefly last week, right? The Boblin, the Goblins, the ones you never plan for, the ones you never really care about, the throwaways, and then there you go, the centerpiece of a revolution. There's a way that you can make it quirky. Make that DMPC kind of a kind of a quirky thing. I gotta say that's my one of my favorite pieces of Les Mis is Gravash, the little boy, right? So yeah, having a good character like that is I think critical. So maybe throwing in an NPC or DMPC that can kind of hold all of that lore for you and for the players, and then they can just kind of take it from there. King or Queen wants to pop tax the population for having fun. Ooh, we. That's not fun. Okay, so thank you for the questions, Spezia. Much appreciated. Moving on, we've got six more questions, and then maybe maybe we'll do a little chat chat. Hopefully, we have some time. I spoke a lot about art corner. We had a long art corner today. The next question is from my mother, Lisa. She actually asked me this question last week, and I didn't fully elaborate on it, so she sent it into the show so that we could have a question and. I want to talk about it, so let's do that. Mom asks, Hello, awesome bard. Do you consider George Carlin, Tupac, Einstein, and Rodney Dangerfield all on your office wall your heroes, mentors, inspirational guides, teachers? What do you call them as a group? Who else is in that group? Keep up the good work. Well, thanks, Mom. I really appreciate it. So, yes, the people that are on my wall, I consider to kind of be my Mount Rushmore of people. So you've, we've got Carlin, Tupac, Einstein, and Ronnie Dangerfield are on the wall. And technically, we've got one piece back there, which is done by Oda, uh, Ichirai Oda, and then that, uh, what's that thing called? The Hallucinogenic Torador, which is a print of a Dolly painting. So I thought about this. I looked up some stuff, kind of going through different words for things, and I think I've decided that the best thing to call them is luminaries. So according to Oxford Dictionary, a luminary is a person who inspires or influences others, especially one prominent in a particular sphere. So for me, I think that it's mostly music and comedy, and I like luminaries because there's also, you know, it's like light. And I've always kind of considered these types of people that I'm going to go through the list of as kind of signposts along the way, which is just, you know, they could be lights. They could be like street lights along the way, but just kind of, you know, people that guide you. So p people that you really respect and try to drive from, uh, try to derive inspiration from and, and who motivate you I think artistically at least for me specifically I'm sure people have all kinds of different luminaries Einstein not so much obviously on the music or comedy tip as much as it's just he was such an influential figure and did a lot to kind of change everything so Robin Williams yeah for sure Robin Robin was a big one for me so here we go besides the Mount Rushmore in no particular order, some others that are incredibly influential to me. Lucille Ball, Bill Hicks, Jack Johnson, Toby Wigway, Tom Petty, Andre 3000, RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan, Gary Gygax. There's way more that I'm not thinking of for sure. Robin Williams, definitely. Maybe, um, maybe Jim Carrey. <laughs> definitely Cat Williams. Cat's great. Oh, man. Cat's so funny. And as of late, maybe some more modern ones. Certainly Will Sasso and Chad Colchin from the podcast Dudesy. Those guys are great, huge influences. My buddy Song has been a great influence for me over the last year or so. Just like we've been building out this concept album together, and he's a really cool dude. And uh, it's been nice to work with somebody that, you know, we, we kind of tend to agree a lot musically, which is kind of rare, you know, usually even with best intentions. 
oh, Chris Farley. How did I not think of Chris Farley? And, you know, he's another big boy. He's another fatty fall down. <laughs> he, he understood that. He had a very tragic, I think, you know, obviously not all of it, right? That's I've recently decided I think that's the purpose of life is to, to, to salvage joy amidst the trauma because the trauma is going to be there. So you just have to kind of salvage the joy. But yeah, Chris Farley, man, he was he was a very he was bigger than life in in more than one way. Jim Belushi, John Candy, all great. And I think too, like no oh man, now I'm thinking of film directors. Now I'm thinking of like Quentin. You know, Quentin Tarantino might have made me want to make movies, or at least I will say this: Quentin Tarantino is probably more influential on in my writing maybe than anybody ever. Because when I started really taking writing seriously in terms of writing like sketches and uh, scripts, like for film, treatments for like shows or films, I think one of my best things is one of the things I excel at is dialogue. And part of that, I think, is because I talk all the time. So I know what people sound like <laughs> but or things that, you know, I, and, and people talk to me a lot, too. So I, like I think that I know how people say things. That's one of the great things about Quentin is this dialogue writing is just like, it's unmatched because it's realistic. That's how people talk. Like in Pulp Fiction, the conversation about the Royale with cheese and stuff, that's like how people have conversations. And a lot of times that kind of stuff gets lost in the plot when it's like any other kind of film. Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, you've mentioned him before. I, I And I've seen him on TikTok. Tesla, Cat. Adam Sandler. Oh, man, I was listening to some early Adam Sandler the other day. It was so funny. He was so blue back in the day. It makes me wonder if if a, if a lot of the family-friendly stuff that he's done was almost his way of, of, of making up for how blue he was so early in his career. Eddie Murphy, Lucas Spielberg. Epic Rap Battles of History with Quentin. I think I did see that one. Vonnegut, Palinuk. Yeah, and even some authors like Edgar Rice Burroughs I have a lot of respect for, and I'm sure that there's way more people that I'm not listing. But I think that I listed the really, really big ones. More contemporary ones, uh, you know, Shannon Sharp and Chad Ochocinco, I watch those guys. Those guys are motivational and inspirational, like the Basement Yard guys. There's a lot of stuff I watch. Elvis, maybe, yeah. Certainly after watching the the new movie, the, the Baz Luhrmann film, I have a lot more appreciation and respect, I think, for Elvis. And just my heart goes out to him, I guess, because it's tough stuff. Eminem, was Eminem on there? Did I say Eminem? I don't think I did. Eminem's real big. Eminem's the reason that I, that I rapped at all. Because he totally, I think, made it such that it didn't really matter at all. You know where you what what the deal was. Anybody could rap. Lady Gaga, Billie Eilish. Billie Eilish is cool. I like Taylor Swift. Oh, Kesha! I can't believe I didn't think of Kesha. Kesha's so great. That album she put out last year, Chef's Kiss. All right, we got to keep moving because we got more questions. But thank you for the question, Mom. And that was fun. I like to talk about people that inspire me. And honestly, like being a luminary is really what I want to accomplish. That's my goal as an artist is to just inspire other people to create stuff. So it's it's the greatest thing in the world for me as an artist when somebody says to me like, hey, here's this thing I made and I made it because I saw this thing you did and it inspired me to make it. And it's like, Phew. Oh, Bobby. Why didn't I think of Bobby? Well, you know, honestly, I don't I don't I don't consider Bobby Lee a luminary as much as I just I think that Bobby's just a good soul. Talk about good soul. Bobby Lee's great. All right. Next question, because we'll just keep talking about this for the rest of the show. Thank you, Mom, for the question. The next question is from Zach. And Zach asks. Hey, Chaz. So my party and I are starting a new campaign after almost a year without playing. So excited. Anyway, I finally finished my build, Moon Circle Druid, but I'm torn between names. I've narrowed it down to two good ones, Bark Wahlberg and Cornelius Compost. I feel like there are benefits and drawbacks to each. What are your thoughts? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Zach. There are indeed pros and cons to both of those names. And cool that you're being a druid. So, I kind of weighed the two against one another. 
I think that Bark Wahlberg, first of all, that's super fun. And you can make it more fun by telling people that your nickname is Barky Bark. You... Cornelius Compost, I think, lends itself to obviously the nickname of Corny, but then tons of jokes surrounding like death and rotting and <laughs> composting. I think that if you're a circle of the moon druid, you're probably going to be wild shaping a lot. And so Bark Wahlberg would probably be great for that because, you know, you could turn into a wolf like pretty much off rip. I think as soon as you get, <laughs> I think as soon as you get your wild shape ability, you can wild shape into a wolf. So definitely recommend thinking about that when it comes to the name. And then also like spells like Bark Skin. I mean, Bark Wahlberg is pretty great. I'm always a fan of whatever's funnier and whatever works for the character more. But I do think that Bark Wahlberg has more legs for jokes. Because in addition to the pun of the name itself, because Mark Wahlberg is an established person in the zeitgeist, you can make tons of references to stuff like New Kids on the Block and like any of the movies that he's done before. So... I think I think it's got to be Bark Wahlberg. <laughs> Barky Bark and the Puppy Bunch. Depends on if you're playing a serious character or a goofy one. Com compost strikes me more as more goofy. That's a good point, too, because Bark Wahlberg, you could take that seriously. Cornelius Compost is tougher to take seriously. So you can have fun with either one of them, but it'd be more difficult to be taken seriously or play it off as seriously with a name like Cornelius Compost. As opposed to Bark Wahlberg, which is like, even if you were to take it seriously, it's like, oh yeah, no, I'm just Bark. Barky Bark. Barkus. <laughs> Barkus Wahlberg. Cornelius Compost is a bard name. Oh, that's true. That's a good point. Cornelius Compost. Well, what would he do? Uh, familiar bear called cub called Ted. For sure. See, see, this is this is much better. I'd for, I'd forgot that Ted even existed. By the way, as a film, so even more even more better. Get yourself a bear friend. Name him Ted. Be Bark Wahlberg. But and may the dice roll in your favor. <laughs> so Cornelius wearing a monocle. Oh yeah. Most definitely. Man, now I kind of want to build Cornelius Compost as a bard. <laughs> really, you really should go with Bark Wahlberg, and then that way we can live <laughs> Barkus Aurelius. <laughs> Bark Wahlberg goes into battle and says, prepare for Max Payne. <laughs> He's a dubstep bard. He breaks down everything. I like that. I like that a lot. Cornelius Compost, the, the, the dubstep bard with a monocle. And then Bark Wahlberg, the moon circle druid. See, these guys could be in the same party, honestly. I was thinking that too, Ron, as a, a would be a druidic, a druidic necromancer. When Cornelius Compost, that w if you were going more of a route where you were doing, like Flim Flam in the Baldur's Gate 3 playthrough is a, a circle of spore druid. So I'm all about that kind of stuff. So Cornelius Compost could be another name for Flim Flam. And... So uh, yeah, and so ultimately it depends on the character and what you like the most, but I think Mark I I think Bark Wahlberg is the way to go on this one. But that's just like my opinion, man. Okay. Well, thank you for the question. That one was easy. We can get through a couple of these, I think, with a little bit of speed because they're not as in, as as intensive of questions as far as going through them. But thank you for the question, Zach. The next question we have is from Brian, and Brian asks, Do you guys do any fan meet and greets? I'm going on a solo road trip down the East Coast in July, coming from Pennsylvania to Florida and back, mainly to clear my head, get away, and enjoy some alone time while visiting some friends I haven't seen in years. I wasn't sure if you guys did anything with fans IRL, as I'll be passing through Jacksonville on my way to Tampa. Well, thank you for the question, Brian. Best of luck to you on that trip. Once you get down here, it, I'll say this. The closer you get to here, the crazier it is. <laughs> but, so, we don't really do much IRL with fans, and we probably should, because I know that we have some in Jacksonville. 
I've been recognized several times over the years by people. We did a, a meet and greet a couple of years ago at a local FLGS, and it was really great. It was so it was really cool. We, everybody was really chill. We got to meet a bunch of people. We sold some merch, just kind of hung out for a little bit, and it was neat. So I'm not opposed to doing it. I think that it's just a matter of planning it and scheduling it. I will say, if you can send me an email, send me another email, Brian, of when you're, uh, what the dates are going to be, and maybe we can work something out. Because honestly, I have been for the last year or so considering doing another type of meet and greet with people just because it's been a while and there, you know, not everybody got to go to the first one. And so it'd be really cool to do. And we've got a couple of, friends locally that do like have FLGSs, have stores or places that we could do something. So it's definitely worth looking into. And so just email me when you're going to be here and maybe we can figure something out. And even if we can't do something with like, you know, as a full meet and greet or something, maybe we can like get together and have a coffee or something just as like if you're passing through because, you know, that's a big trip that you're going to be making probably straight up and down 95 so definitely drive safe definitely prepare for that and make sure you know where you're going because like i said the further you get the closer you get to here the crazier it is i was thinking about it today dealing with traffic it is really nuts i feel like people are either on prescription drugs either and or not paying attention or both <laughs> so <clears throat> excuse me it can be a bit dangerous down here but I'm excited for you. That sounds fun. I hope that you get an opportunity to, you know, even if we don't get to see you and we don't do anything, I hope you get an opportunity to kind of chill and clear your head a bit. I you know road trips are really, I think, good for that. When I was, uh, when I just got out of high school, I my buddies and I went out on a road trip to Branson, Missouri, and it was like a once in a lifetime experience. And so, yeah, driving will definitely give you that opportunity to clear your head and just take some time for yourself and, and do some self-care and heal and hang out with friends and enjoy yourself. So send, a, send me an email. Let me know when specifically you'll be in town and maybe we can get something together. I hate commuting, but I love road trips. Yeah, most definitely. Road trips are fun. I've been on that. I think that the Missouri one, well, I, I went to a lot of places when I was a kid. I was very fortunate enough to travel around to a lot of places. But I think that the biggest one as as an adult was probably the Missouri trip, although I've taken little mini, mini road trips here and there. We went up to North Carolina one time to help some friends move. We went up to uh, more than once I've done a spontaneous Savannah trip, just like in the middle of the night, just like, oh, let's just go up to the let's just go up to Savannah. PA to Texas is the longer drive by far. <laughs> Texas to anywhere is long. Right. Yeah, Texas is like a different planet. Being able to work from home since the pandemic has made me really appreciate the lack of rush hour traffic in my living room. You don't have to tell me to say it louder for those in the back because and and I'll tell you what, since I have gotten out of the whole kind of nine to five gig, because I mean, I still have a like a quote unquote job that I go to. That's a physical location, but most of my work is remote. And somehow I always end up in five o'clock traffic. It happened to me today. I was just like, oh, here we are. It's I actually missed it. I missed the worst of it, to be fair, because I did get home before five. But I have a tendency to do that to myself where I just either lack of planning or just generally people taking too long to drive. I have a theory that a lot of people on the road don't want to get to where they're going. And that's part of the problem. Even if it's subconscious, you know, like if you hate your job, you don't want to get there. So what 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 incentive do you have to keep the line moving? You know what I mean? A road trip in Houston is just a four hour trip to the other side of Houston. One of my favorite parts of a road trip is the ability to just stop wherever you feel like to check it out. No doubt. One time when we were in our rock band in my early 20s, we took a trip up to my buddy Ryan's house. His parents lived in Rome, Georgia at the time. So it's about a five, six hour trip. This is on the northern side of Atlanta. And that was fun. We we got walkie-talkies, and so that it was a bit of a convoy. I mean, it was just two of us, but, you know, we had walkie-talkies that we could talk to each other on the way, and that was really cool. And we just kind of went up there and just made stuff up. So, uh, made stuff up, made a bunch of music. Mainly like working from home, but miss people sometimes. Gets a bit lonely. Yeah, for sure. It's tough. I have such a different experience because I work in a store where there's a lot of foot traffic. So I interact with people all the time. 
And so I think that there's pros and cons, right? Like for me, I love when there's nobody around <laughs> because most of the time there's a lot of people around. If I'm not interacting with people or interfacing with people online, I'm doing it in person at the store. So it's down in Ocala in December. Oh, geez. You probably mentioned it to me, Pirate, and I just like didn't respond. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. But I, th I think I do remember that now. I always preferred the graveyard shift. The less people, the better. Yeah, I worked graveyard shift at Walmart when I lived in Michigan. Okay, moving on. I think we got an answer to that question. Brian, like I said, send me an email. Let me know when you're coming, and we'll, maybe we'll figure it out. Uh, next question's from Chris, because this shows part advice, and we have questions from Chris. And Chris asks... A great deal of game economy is based on the premise that stores are willing to buy items from adventurers, where in our modern day, there are only a handful of places that will buy items from people. What are your thoughts on implementing a system in-game where shops would only buy items from players at roughly half their value? Thank you for the question, Chris. I love this idea, and we see this idea in action in a lot of RPGs. In fact, I remember, I remember back in the day when I would play Oblivion, Hey, Mom. I remember back in the day when I would play Oblivion, I would sell stuff to store owners just to, like, immediately pull the inventory back up to see what they were then selling it for. And the markup was always insane. So so GameStop, yeah, or Pawn Stars comes to mind. But always, it'd be like, I'm going to sell this. And, I, and even with, like, a high, you know, mercantile or whatever it is, speechcraft, even with a high score in that with like good deals for the bartering I'd be like all right i'm gonna sell you the sword and they'd be like all right i'll give you 50 50 gold for it and it's like okay cool and then you sell it to them and then you pull their inventory back up <laughs> and it's like here's that sword. that sword you just sold me now i'm selling it for 172 gold and it's like okay but i like that because for one it makes it such that the, the the players appreciate the equipment that they already have more. And also, it I, I think adds an element of RP as to like, because as much as I play like kind of a wild card, you know, kooky, you know, murder hobo a, a lot of the times, I do tend to focus on details of things. So my inventory is always planned out really well. Like I always know how much weight I'm carrying so I'm not over encumbered. I I make sure that my character has eaten or slept, etc. And I, for me, that's just like part of the RP. It's and it's also kind of part of the challenge in front of the game, right? I mean, if we're just gonna go around and you know swing axes at stuff and kill it, and then it's like, okay, well, you could do that with anything. But I think part of the thing with D and D is that there's a lot of stuff to keep track of when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I think it's really cool. I I, I welcome that kind of stuff because. Again, you know, most of the time when you start a campaign, you have some sort of starting gear. And a lot of times as you when you get gear throughout, it's either something that was like awarded to you or something that you got as a result of combat. So in terms of selling items to just like get a bunch of gold to then use to buy other OP items, it's just like, eh, I don't know about that. It's shopkeepers got to eat, got <laughs> those crack and dice ain't going to order themselves. Yes. Thank you, Bean. Oh man. What a great opportunity for a plug for the dice. Thank you, Bean. Remember everybody, if you're just joining us or you didn't see earlier, the Sarah dice are available at crack and dice.com. So go over to crack and dice.com and get yourself a set of Sarah dice. But yeah, I think this is a great idea. I think it should be implemented. I, I think we already see it in a lot of RPGs. I certainly experienced it in BG3, right? Like, you know, you sell a you sell a thing for seven gold, that 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 trader's gonna be then reselling it themselves for like twenty five. It's just kind of the nature of first thing I give my players is a bag of holding, so nobody has to worry about wait. Wow, that's really cool. So I always have a wagon and a chest, so I'm never encumbered. Yeah, I tend to try and pay attention to that stuff. I always make sure that it's like, okay, I have a backpack, and this is what's in my backpack. And Hello, flexible nerd. Uh, sorry, I didn't see or say, see you say hi earlier. I thought the only one who calculated way. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I calculate that stuff for sure. I pay attention to all of that stuff. I'm like, what is this? A pen? How much is this? A pound? Is this going to encumber me? Picked up two sets of dice. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo. It's much appreciated. Usually the first magic item you go for. Bag of, bag, bag of holding, yeah. 
Honestly, for me, and it, it, I tend to do this in BG3 too, but I, in, in D&D, it's like whoever, ha whoever has the highest carrying capacity. Like if I'm running a barbarian with a, with a 20 strength or even an 18 strength, I'm way less worried about being encumbered because that's going to take a while. But, you know, if you're a gnome bard, <laughs> it's like you're not going to be able to carry more than like 100 pounds or something. So you should know what you have. And I think that anything that you're carrying is included in that. Some DMs are cool about it. They're like, oh, well, we don't really care about weight. But I think for me, that stuff matters. I'll over encumber you for sure. I'll keep track of that and pay attention and be like, oh, what's that? You picked that mace up? Oh, well, now you can't move. Better figure it out. <laughs> not strong enough. Or at a minimum, you you know, you're moving at half speed or whatever. The backpack of holding. Goliath or a bugbear or something. True. Yeah. You don't even have to, not, not even necessarily have to be a member of the party. You could just like hire somebody to carry your stuff around. Or get like a horse or a, a donkey. Or like to Pirate's, to Pirate's point, a wagon. Don't hound my party about their carry weight. But because I know they will hoard items, I usually just have them acquire a carriage or cart and horses. True. It's the I think that's the nature of things too. Wagon's probably the best way to go, like a wagon or a or a carriage. Got a couple of players that would carry a half a mile of rope and ladder. Interesting. I always have rope. I'll say that about any of my characters. They always have at least fifty feet of rope, if not a hundred. Compared pics of that crack and dice, Sarah. Yeah, I uh, I know. <laughs> we were doing variant encumbrance. I was playing uh, Khajiit. Oh, Tabaxi's, yeah. Khajiit has wares if you have coin. And a lantern. That's right. Always have a rope and a light. Hey, that's a lyric. But it's true. And I always do. I always have, and usually a way to start a fire. I think those are the three big ones. Rope, light, way to start a fire. And technically a way to start a fire could double as light, but... Just having an extra light is always helpful. In the oxen drowning era, you mean the Oregon Trail? Is that what you're talking about? Did anybody ever make it to Oregon? Like, genuinely? Like, in class? I don't think I ever made it. I think that there was this kid that made it one time. You let them use the restroom to get unencumbered again? No, no. Most DMs don't track restroom stuff. That's true. So people will track food and sleep and think it's important usually where we will play where a backpack sleeping gear change of clothes and armor doesn't count for weight but other stuff you would buy counts for weight and i think that that's how most people play right like i don't think most people consider the long sword that they're carrying part of their encumbrance i do but i don't think most people do that so i like the idea i certainly like the idea of you, know, you being able to get less for your items because it discourages you know, just looting for the sake of then selling off the items for gold for later stuff, I suppose. Didn't make it to Oregon until I played my... Th yeah, same. And also didn't realize you could just totally bypass the river. I think that's the bit that we put into the episode, because I didn't realize that until I actually did the research on it and played it again. <laughs> but, okay. All right, well, that's that's the answer for Chris. Got an answer in there for you. The next question, and please direct me in, because I've gotten a couple of questions from this person, and I still am not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I'm not sure if it's Cal or Cale or Cali. Please correct me. <laughs> but this is from them, <laughs> and their question is, Hi. I know you're a Jaguars fan, and I saw that Amit Patel got sentenced to six and a half years in prison for defrauding the Jaguars. I have no insight to this, but can you give us a quick TLDR over the situation and how it affected the team, in your opinion? For anybody that doesn't know, TLDR is too long, didn't read. It's basically just, you know, give me the short synopsis of it. So I didn't actually know the full extent of this story until I dug into it more. Obviously, I think that this came out, like, a while ago and he's been in well obviously it would have had to happen a while ago because if he's just been sentenced you know courts courts not courts not fast trials don't go quickly so it's probably been going on for the last year or so basically from what i understand 
you know, I think it's un- I think it's an un- I'll first say I think it's an unfortunate situation all around. But then again, we typically have unfortunate stuff surrounding the Jaguars. It's <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of how we are down here. So for so basically, the story is this: Amit Patel worked for the Jaguars. Apparently, he was the sole administrator. Red flag of the team's virtual credit card system, red flag. And supposedly this stuff happened between 2019 and 2023. So effectively what this guy did is he defrauded the Jaguars by effectively stealing close to 22 or maybe a little over $22 million. Million, 22 million gadzooks. And so this happened between 2019 and 2023. And so I'm not a math guy, but I did some quick math. In five years, that's approximately 1,820 days-ish. That comes out to like $12,000 a day. Okay? So clearly zero oversight about this. I guess what this guy, what it comes down to is this guy had a gambling addiction, has a gambling problem. And by the way, he's done this at other companies, which is even more crazy because it's like, where's the due diligence on the hiring process of this guy? Like this guy who had previously defrauded a company this same way for this same reason and who had been forced to pay money back to this company for doing this thing. We just put that guy and put that guy in charge of the credit cards and the only guy. What are we doing? Looks like most of the money was funneled into and used in gambling apps like DraftKings, probably stuff like FanDuel, I'm sure. But he was also just like living the life of luxury. He bought like a Tiger Woods club for like 48 grand. Nobody thought that was weird. None of his buddies were like, where did he get 50 grand to buy a Tiger Woods golf club? It just seems insane. And m- mostly, more than anything, I'm shocked that nobody saw this going on. It's just like $22 million? Where's the oversight? What is going on in the financial? Not, not a secretary, not. You don't have an accountant that signs off on this kind of stuff? I, there's not quarterly reports? I just don't, it's hard to believe that this went on for like five years. It's just, well, four, right? Wow, so it's even more than I said, actually. Well, no, 19, 20, 21, 22. So he would have been caught in 23. So yeah, five years. And he's getting six and a half. So that's, I don't know. (laughs) For context, that would be like signing Trevor Lawrence twice. <laughs> hey, hey, we might have done that, actually. We picked up Mac Jones. I don't know if you've seen. <laughs> so maybe we might actually have, have, we might have done that. I think they would have cut off more than his hand. <laughs> 22 million. Yeah, maybe. That's why I don't gamble despite liking a lot of the games. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been known to dabble here and there with like DraftKings and stuff. But, you know, dollar games, $2 games. And certainly not in such a way where it's I'm stealing people's money to pay for it. That's so crazy. Oh, hey, hey, Justin. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty insane. But then again, we fired Mike Caldwell and kept Press Taylor. So who knows what we're doing. But that's the story of what's going on with Amit Patel. And as far as how I think it affects the the organization, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bad look. But, I mean, we do stuff that's a bad look all the time. <laughs> And um, you know, I will say this: it, it's here's this is a this is a great opportunity to clean house when it comes to that kind of stuff, or at a minimum, like up your standards of what you're doing with money. This is government stuff, right? You know how the government's always like, "Hey, so here's the thing: we there were there were ten trillion dollars, we lost half of that." This is that kind of behavior. It's like, oh, uh, yeah. We, uh, we like, who are you answering to? If you're just, if your answer is like, so anyway, we hired this guy who had a history of ripping people off. Turns out he ripped us off for five years straight. And we didn't have any idea because he was doing it with a system that he was the only one in charge of. It just feels like you don't know what's going on in your company, in your organization. So figure it out. 
22 million than free housing for six years. So, yeah, pretty crazy. All right. So, thank you for the question, uh, Callie or Cal or Cal, Calais. Much appreciated. And let's get into this last question and then we'll do a little bit of chat chat. So, the next, the last question of the evening is from Marco. And Marco asks, Salutations, Charles. First up, love the pod, and I really hope you keep it going. Second, I just started watching your Baldur's Gate 3 Dark Urge playthrough. Flim Flam is great. Thank you. My question is, are you planning on staying as a druid for all 12 levels, or do you plan on multi-classing at some point? I haven't run a druid yet, so I'd love to see their full power. Thanks. Well, thank you for the question, Marco. Indeed, the plan is for Flim Flam to remain as a druid, to finish as a spore druid. I will say, I was giving consideration to multiclassing, especially Flim Flam, especially considering that I'm finding in more enjoyment in the bow and kind of using the spore druid stuff as a, as a buff to that. Right, So the coolest thing about the Spore Druid is that one of your abilities is called Symbiotic Entity. Effectively, when you cast it, you cast it on yourself as an action. It gives you, it grants you temporary hit points based on your con bonus. And also, more importantly, it grants you an additional D6 of necrotic damage to any of your attacks. So uh, Spore Druid Necro Wiz is, oh, I bet, dude. So I was considering maybe maybe going into something else, like maybe even like a rogue or ranger. But I've decided after the last session, because we're, we're a ways off from this in the playthrough itself, right? You haven't seen it. But in the last session that we had, we hit level six. And so that means I can now wild shape into a panther and an owl bear. I'm in. You couldn't drag me away from druid at this point because now because like ever since i've gotten that all i could think about is how eventually i'm going to be able to wild shape into a dinosaur and into a saber tooth tiger and the saber tooth tiger gets just like auto healing they get just like like a free 2d8 of health every turn that's so great yes and most definitely time for owl bear from the top rope because man i'm so excited i might end up just being an owl bear for like most of the rest of the playthrough because it's just been so cool to change into. I have to play a drow sor source named Blizzard. <laughs> I'm going fighter for a multi-class, but I rarely go past three unless I'm maining a fighter. Yeah, if I do end up taking any other classes, it would probably be from either Rogue or Ranger, but that would really only more be about being able to do either extra damage or better damage with... You know, like a Gloomstalker. Whoops. Sorry about that. There's three levels to get Gloomstalker, which grants you that uh, Dread Ambusher, which is really nice. But I really do. I'm like 98% sure. At barring something insane happening, I'm, I'm going to finish as a Druid. Because so far playing as a Druid has been really fun. And I can only imagine that it's going to get better. So... And thankfully, I've had River. River's been a great guide and been very helpful for me in terms of the Spore Druid. In fact, he was the one that recommended the class just in general to me first. He was like, hey, check out this busted crazy thing. And so when we started the Flim Flam run, I was like, oh, this is perfect for Flim Flam. Like, I, I considered for him to be a monk. We've got Justin as our monk, Jasper Poppycock, who's way better. <laughs> it's way fun. And Flim Flam's just doing his Druid thing. So going to tend to... I tend to want to keep doing that. If you could shape into a woolly mammoth and have someone mount f with the mount feet ride you and just wreck all your enemies, that would be so sick. That would bring me back to, like, Halo days when I was the Warthog driver. Druids, given the refusal to wear armor, generally best a solo class. Barbarian, multi-works, wild shape, or rage, or monk. Also, unarmed attack or defense. More spellcasting, weaker since split. Didn't someone restart to do rogue stuff? Does the party still have a rogue? We don't have a rogue in this Flim Flam party. Uh, the the Flim Flam party is uh, Flim Flam is a is a wood elf circle of spores druid. Jasper Poppycock is a half orc monk. Ryan is Apple, 
who is a half elf. I, th- I think he's a half elf fighter. He might even be like a full up, uh, like a straight up elf fighter. But I think he's a half elf. And then Cody is a halfling bard. And he's a full bard, but he's a combat bard. So that's been fun. Oh, uh, respecking and stuff. Well, we do that all the time anyway. Oh, you took three levels in Rogue? Oh, you haven't yet. That's your plan. I see. Good thinking, Justin. A Rogue. I know. Believe me, Pirate. I, the, the, the wait for crossplay is real. So, okay. Wow. We're already getting close to wrapping up. We're definitely into chat chat. So why don't we have some chat chat? Well, this has been kind of a chatty episode anyway. But let's, let's have some chat chat. Maybe we could do some good things of the week. Anybody have any good things for the week? I'd say the good things for me for the week is certainly the Sarah Dice being live. There's another opportunity for a plug there. Get your Sarah Dice at crackandice.com. But that's, you know, a good thing. I enjoy watching those documentaries. I've been making progress with song on the on the concept album. I'm excited for for that to, you know, once we finish it. We're getting close. I think we're here towards in like I think we're in like the third act of the composition of it. So that's been exciting. What do you got? What's your good stuff? We'll take Rogue early on if you're going to multi. That might not be a bad idea because I know early Rogue, I mean, if you're going to only take three ro- three levels anyway, you might as well get it out of the way. Yeah, Pirate, you introduced new coworkers to Organized Lightning. That's really cool of you. I appreciate that. Prepping the yard for more Garden State. Today's your birthday and you're 51 today. Well, happy birthday, Cat Jazz. Well, I just smashed the microphone. Sorry, I hope that didn't like wreck anybody's ears. Happy birthday, Cat Jazz. Everybody say happy birthday, Cat Jazz. Is there any way to get a deal on the Sarah Dice? Not at the moment. Not that I'm aware of, although potentially in the future. So. Oh, yeah, Justin's going to Lisbon. That's right, for his movie thing. You got to see Nickelback at the Rodeo on Wednesday. Show was amazing. Had a great time. Lost your voice screaming so much. Oh, yeah. I think the last time I did that was when we watched Census Fail play out the Let It Unfold You album and, at uh, <laughs> at the Underbelly. I probably lost my voice there, but that was years ago. Whoa, chat's moving too fast. Uh, the lathe I crashed a few weeks ago and has new parts and alignment completed. Nearly ready to run again. Nice. Girlfriend's home health hours got approved, so you get to be your so you get paid to be your caregiver. Nice. Everybody's saying happy birthday to Cat Jazz. You had Trimmers Marathon this week, all seven movies and the TV series. You know, I haven't seen. I didn't realize that there were seven. There's seven. I knew there was a series, but there's seven. I've seen four. I might have seen Trimmers five. But that does sound really fun. Uh, still here and alive and healing from heart surgery. Yes, of course, Ruby. Thank you for always joining us. I'm glad to hear that you're on the mend. They did make a series for Tremors pretty recently, right? Just like within the last couple of years. Also going live on the Discord to do your unboxing. Oh, heck yeah. Oh, man, I'm excited for that. St. Patty's Day Sundays. Don't forget. Oh, yeah, and it is St. Patrick's Day. So, wow, I totally forgot. Well, I don't drink. <laughs> I mean, I am Irish, but it's, I guess, less relevant for people who don't drink. But hope everybody has a fun and safe St. Patrick's Day. Get yourself a designated driver. Or, better yet, just don't even leave your house. Just hang out at the house. So, uh, the first six are currently free on YouTube. Wow. You can legit watch the first trimmers for free on YouTube. That movie is so good just by itself. Like, it becomes its own thing, I think, when you include all the sequels. But similar to, like, stuff like Saw or The Matrix, in my opinion, I feel like it could have just, you could have just left it alone at one. We didn't really need any of that other stuff. Oh, yeah, March Madness is coming up, no doubt. That'll be fun. March Madness is always fun. And we're getting close here on the NBA, too. What are we? We got, like, 15, 17 games left. It's going to get real here soon for an NBA. Tremors 2 was fun. Yeah, Tremors 2 was when they could walk. And Bert is definitely... <laughs> you broke into the wrong right damn rec room. Yeah, man. God, I love that movie. That I And my, my mom will tell you, I watched that movie so much as a kid. I thought it was the coolest thing. And also kind of ripe for kids from the 90s, right? Because there's that scene where it's like the, the floor is lava when they have to like pole vault across all the rocks. 
power's out. Sorry to hear that. Go box Baker Evans went. Oh yeah, you know what? I didn't even get to talk about that, and I put up some. I, I made some stuff for this. So in the, on the NFL stuff, I'm sure that you're excited as a Bucks fan. For the Jags, we picked up Mac Jones. We also, which honestly, I was a fir- I was kind of salty about it first, but uh, you know, after thinking about it a little bit and hearing other people's opinions about it, I feel a little differently. I think it's it's a pretty good pickup. It's nice as a backup, just in case, you know. And hey, maybe they'll even maybe they'll even compete. Who knows? Their their numbers aren't that far apart. <laughs> if you really look at their numbers, they're not that far apart. We also picked up Gabe Davis from the Bills. It's a shame that we kind of let Calvin Ridley go, but honestly, like I think that he underperformed last year. I'm not going to give him a bunch of money if we can get this guy for less or the same, and then maybe figure something out with him. And uh, Devin uh, Duvernay as well. He might be something. We picked up some other players that I didn't mention. We picked up a center, which is nice. I can't think of his name at the moment. But that makes me happy as someone who's always fighting for focus on the O-line. It's nice to see that we've at least done something with that. And um, Eric Armstead as well from the 49ers. So that might be some help on defense. But we'll have to see. Don't know. I'm you know I'm always going to be a Jags fan and root for the Jags. We'll see what's going on. Trimmers made the phrase, son of a bitch, canon in the movies. Whoa, really? <laughs> Let's see. It's crazy raining a bit. Yeah, it was, oh my gosh, it was so hot today. It was 90 degrees today. It's March 15th. What's going on? I mean, I know I live in Florida, but what? What are we doing? 90 degrees. No. No thanks. A D and D draft and trade edition that might be fun. We did do a football edition one time. It might be fun to do draft edition. The trouble is, is that there's just not enough crossover, which is hard to say as someone who loves both. And obviously, there's people in the chat here and people that listen to this podcast that can appreciate both sports and fantasy. There's got it. We need more crossover on that. We really do. People got to understand that, like these these sports these athletes are just like real life heroes and there's a structure of rules for like what game it is they're playing it's totally the same thing bringing jordan whitehead back from the jets like baseball but not really a big sports fan i can't stand baseball for me it's basketball first and then football i grew up a football i grew up in a football house i grew up in florida that's it my mom's a huge football fan time to go to the beach soon yeah maybe geez if it's gonna be this hot if only the Jags were orcs or elves. Oh, yeah, if we were like the Jacksonville orcs. That actually would be pretty cool. Yo, I bet to somebody's done that. I'm gonna. That's going to be my thing I'm going to try to do this week is find people that have... Uh, I wonder if anybody's ever like remade the... <laughs> remade the NFL and or NBA logos as like fantasy type teams. Logos and stuff. Fingers crossed Astros go all the way. <laughs> I've I've I don't get baseball, which is weird because I get cricket. I think cricket is super cool, and I'm not nearly as into it as I once was. But I think cricket's awesome. Baseball, not so much. Like baseball and basketball as a kid, watching the Olympics. Went to parent teacher conference and learned my middle schooler brought up her grades and improved her testing by seventy five percent. Whoa! Nice work. Congratulations. Doing something right. That's great news. Aaron Jones catches the pass. <laughs> oh, and speaking of uh, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers is going to be a VP, I guess. I really think that guy just needs to retire at this point. It's like, uh, you know what he really needs to do? And maybe he does have one. I don't know. I don't know much about Aaron Rodgers. Here's what he needs to do. He needs a podcast. Because I feel like he could get a lot of this whole, like, you know, check me out attention thing done with just a podcast of his own. But it just always seems like he's, it's like he's always in the news, but he's not, like, winning championships. (laughs) It's like, he won one one time, that one time. But, like, he's, like, people are always talking about him, and yet, what is it? He hasn't even played in, like, over a year. Or at least a year. When, 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 when was it that he got hurt? Well, maybe not that long. Because he because he was like first game of the season. So probably like eight months or something. 
He's on the podcast with Pat McAfee. Yeah. Didn't he like get taken off of that or something? I don't know. I thought I heard Pat say something about how he wasn't going to be on there anymore. Zombie football. Yeah. Four touchdown passes in high school. Wait a minute. Are you are you referring to Al Bundy, who ran four touchdowns in one single game for Polk County? <laughs> oh, he did come back. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it just seems like very much pick a lane. If, by the way, for no other reason, more than just like because you need to figure it out, but also like there are people that would love the opportunity to have his quarterback job that are probably just kind of hanging around on the vine because everything is like, oh, Aaron Rodgers is going to be our guy. And it's also a lot of drama that the Jets are going to have to deal with in the offseason. Even if, like, let's just say for the sake of argument, he doesn't get picked to be RFK's VP. Or let's say that he does, and then it doesn't go well, and then he stay, and he keeps playing football. The Jets aren't going to be able to just, like, avoid that conversation. They're going to get asked. People are going to ask him about it. People are going to ask Aaron Rodgers directly about it, and he probably wants to talk about it. So, I don't know. I just think he needs to keep on moving. Keep keep moving down the road. Do your own thing. Some guy gets hit too hard, loses his head. Someone drops the ball and picks up his head for a touchdown. <laughs> yeah, that's like full fantasy. That's that's well, that's real fantasy football, dude. All right. Well, we're already here at the end. I can't believe it. I can't believe it, folks. We did it again. So we're going to wrap up here. Before we go, just a quick reminder, one last plug here on the Sarah Dice over at KrakenDice.com. Go just get yourself some Sarah Dice. Much, much appreciated of the support there. This is the second of four limited runs we'll be doing. So go and grab yourself some if you haven't already or pick some up for a friend that you know would appreciate them. Also, a reminder again before we leave of the email, bardevice at gmail.com. Any questions, concerns, complaints, compliments, criticisms, critiques, stories, follow-ups, art corner pieces, send them over to bardevice at gmail.com. It also looks like bar dad vice. That helps you remember. If you want to get some merch, you can do so at manshorts.com or at krakendice.com where you can get those air dice. And if you want to contribute to anything that I'm doing musically, you can do so directly via PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo, all of which are Yazik, Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. I will be back here next week. Same Bard time, same Bard channel, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Man Shorts YouTube channel. The audio for this podcast will be, as always, made available tomorrow at 12 p.m. noon Eastern Standard Time. I hope that everybody has a fantastic weekend. I hope that you have a great week next week, and we will see you next time.